Brian Cahoot, president of HJ Wealth Management. My um, co-host is Tom Alvare. He's a fellow CPA PFS and president of Comprehensive Investment Solutions. Our special guest is Jerry Elman um, from Elman Technology Law. He's an attorney. We have an exciting program, um, so I'm glad you joined us. Tom, I know you do a lot of advanced planning for families. What kind of issues are you dealing with? Um, there's a lot of cross currents in the market. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. this shows tape, so we tell people, you know, don't time off anything to say. But, you know, what kind of issues are you dealing with with clients currently? Well, clients primarily are shocked by last year. Uh, oil got cheap. Um, it had a strange effect on some of their uh, stock holdings. And uh, I think one of the biggest questions we're getting after year end is, well, gee, I thought the markets were doing better. Why aren't I making more money? Um, so, you know, looking into that and dealing with um, those factors that are affecting market outcomes, we invest globally for our clients. And uh, foreign investments had a couple of headwinds last year. Their economies have not come back like the U.S. has. And one of the things they're going to do about it, we hear, is uh, do a quantitative easing where the uh, European Central Bank is going to buy a lot of bonds from sovereign governments and basically provide liquidity to the system. Uh, our country, as many people know, we went through that already. Right. And uh, our belief is it had uh, a dramatic impact on the stock market. We're coming to the end of that program domestically, but then oil got cheap last year and uh, the dollar got strong and it really impacted the net return our clients made on foreign investing. So it muted their returns a bit. On the other side, we have commodities that we generally put in people's portfolios, and commodities are generally dominated by oil and natural gas and other uh, energy plays, and it was extremely negative with the decline in prices last year, basically erasing any commodity returns we had in other commodities. Uh, REITs were a good story, and our clients are happy to see that. Uh, but mostly what we deal with are people then internalizing, now what does this mean to me? Right. Am I still okay is really the question. And although average returns last year may have been under you know, 10%, what people expect to make on stocks, right, yeah. uh, you know, when you blend bonds in there and you blend other types of investments through a diversification approach that we take, uh, you generally make less than 10. So we build our clients' financial plans and expectations around realistic returns. And we're keenly aware of the possibility that there will be years that disappoint. Sure. So, so that's really the essence of their question. Am I still on track? Should I save more? Um, you know, I was going to retire next year. Are things working out as we wanted them to? And uh, a year that's not extremely negative generally is one that we've accounted for in their projections. And. Um, you know, aside from some potential adjustments that might be made for someone who is about to take money out and the markets haven't performed as expected, it's kind of business as usual. Uh, if you turn the clock ahead to the end of January and look at how foreign versus domestic markets are doing, uh, foreign markets are ahead for the last quarter. Right. So it gets us back to our core discussion with our clients that markets are volatile, we can't control them, we diversify and uh, mitigate risk through what, what they own. And we try to have our clients control what they can control. Keep saving, manage your spending. If you can modify your retirement date, if that's the goal you're trying right. to fund, you can control when that is to a large degree. And uh, you know, we help them figure out whether that's going to make their plans work out. And don't chase returns, right? Because exactly. I think what you're saying is U.S. did good and now everybody wants to go all U.S. and right. forget the rest of the world. And right. that's probably the worst time to do it, right? I agree. <laughs> so. yeah. And after the run we've had in the U.S. Right. since 2009, it uh, might need to take a breather. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, so, you know, it looks like interest rates are here to stay. Um, and, you know, I guess obviously I've been saying for years clients will only have this chance to refinance and I keep extending that discussion. Have you seen that as a real opportunity for your clients to really? Most of them have refinanced. Debt management is uh, an important part of what we look at. It's an element the, of the net worth for each client. And uh, a lot of clients, even with rates now low, are so insecure about markets. We do entertain strategies that are debt reduction and the rate of return is the interest saved. And for many clients, that's the security of, that, of knowing that or managing the outcome of that is uh, more favorable than taking market risk. Yeah. So even in a low interest rate environment, now that there's a lower expectation on returns, 
um, you know, we're back to having people reduce debt if they want more security. Yeah, and there's a big psychological factor, obviously, is what we both do. We, we have similar practices. Um, you know, I think the hardest thing you mentioned for clients is are they okay and how much can they take out of their portfolio? There's this, you know, theory of what everyone calls it the 4% withdrawal rate. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can limit your withdrawals, every time it's a 4% of your portfolio, you should be good no matter what right. the market does. Right. Is, is that how you would approach? Well, that's income? a good back of the napkin approach. And we might evaluate, you know, a general question with that in mind, but we don't really adhere to it. And we're concerned about it as many are writing about with diminished return potential, 4% might be too much. I mean, the rule base is, uh, is based on 4% coming out. They're expecting to leave additional returns in. So if a client's making six or seven, there's two to 3% left in for inflation buffer. Inflation is an unknown. Future returns are an unknown. So it's a good starting point, but we really think clients should project their futures out beyond that because in retirement, there are other things that could happen. You know, it's the income you take every year may not need to be the same or may need to increase based on other factors. Right. So the 4% rule is a good starting point. However, if we can have clients survive on less, um, you know, by virtue of managing their spending or having other sources of income, it stretches the longevity of their portfolio out and gives them more options for, for things that happen in the future. I mean, life is dynamic. Yep. And uh, so we apply what we call a financial planning continuum to our clients just to deal with changes in their lives, changes in careers, changes in the world around us. And uh, even the 3% rule or the 4% rule, depending on which side you aspire to, mm -hmm. is now in question. Right. Basically, a lot of old things that people thought need to be reevaluated. And the best way to do it is in their personal context. Yeah, absolutely. And, and life expectancy is another wild card, right? right? They're only getting better and longer, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so people haven't envisioned, I'm sure you have clients in their hundreds, I have them. Mm -hmm. Nobody envisioned, you know, we'd be that day that we're planning yeah. for 100 sure. plus years of re in retirement income. So. Yeah, and that exacerbates the declining health issue yeah. and what that might mean and how much that might cost and how do clients mitigate that. Yes, my parents are still alive and they're in their mid to late 80s yeah, that's great. and healthy. And uh, yeah, we have many, many clients that are going beyond their original projections. So what do you guys use to project life expectancy when, when yeah, you're looking we, at someone's money? We, we, I mean, we're using probably 90, between 90 and 95. Mm -hmm. And as, as you probably very similar to you, we want to make sure there's a big cushion at that end because yes. right. you know, if they live to 100, you right. know, I mean, and this is what I tell clients, <clears throat> and I'm sure you do the same, is you know, they ask what keeps me up at night. It's not the market. It's running out of money, right? Mm -hmm. That's their biggest risk, sure. and that's the one they think the least about, right? right? Um, yep. It's, can I lose it all in the market? What's the market doing today? And I'm like, don't worry about that. As you said very eloquently, it's, it's worry about things you can control, right. right? Right. And, you know, to tell me, well, I'm not going to live that long, mm -hmm. but I said, well, what if you do? Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. So. And death is not one of those things we put in the clients can control column right. yet, yeah. but um, except for certain exceptions, maybe, but. Um, yeah, the, you know, to, to avoid running out of money, the longevity question is really pressing it. And I agree with you, that is my greatest concern as an advisor for people. Generally, that's what they hire us for, yeah. help yeah. us plan that this won't happen. Uh, but a lot of things come, come our way. You know, we, we just went through really three horrible markets in the last right. 15 years. Right. Yeah. And a lot of retirees or near retirees had to reevaluate their lives. And then add to that living longer and healthcare being very expensive and not able to pass on, you know, to insurance the cost of, or not being able to uh, really absorb the cost of uh, increased care. Everyone wants care in their home and it's really expensive. So yeah. I like that the care options are kind of developing more choice for people as they age and more choice in their home. Uh, however, they're very expensive. Yeah. and. Uh, long-term care insurance to mitigate it is in a state of flux also right. and difficult to hang your your hat on for it to work out yeah it's, I mean, it's how a long do you guys way to get, handle that? yeah no i mean same thing conceptually we think people should have long-term care insurance until you look at the price and say wow mm -hmm. how do you pay for this for you know like all insurance right. it's a cost you hope you never use sure. um and then just when you dump it is when you need it, mm -hmm. right? So, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you're dealing with this. Our clients tend to be the baby boomer age, and um, they're dealing with parents, right, that mm -hmm. are starting to need this care, and, right. and that's 
you know, a big contingency on our client's financial plan if you didn't expect it, because that generation wasn't very open about their finances, right? right? World War II yeah. generation, sure. so a lot of our clients have no idea if their parents are okay, right? right? right. So, um, and so really we put that in our plan, hey, if that care falls on the you, it's something you have to deal sure. with. And so I think the message to the viewers is, if you don't know your parents' financial situation, you gotta weasel Find your way a, in somehow and I try agree. to have that conversation, which is difficult as it is. So. Well, do it in a way of um, offering to be part of the safety net solution. You know, everyone knows we're mortal and our faculties decline as we age and we all need help or need a safety net. And I find that helping younger clients approach their parents with, hey, I want to be part of the solution. I need help. And if, if there's a privacy issue, we've had clients actually uh, invite us to speak with right. their parents so we can sort of keep some confidentiality sure. there. Uh, but uh, those same clients, the, the boomer generation is at the peak of their career, life is busy. A lot of their children came back or stayed home, they get married later. Some of them are just beginning to have grandchildren now. So they have it from all angles. And, yeah, that's why uh, they call them the sandwich generation, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. And so they come to us and ask us for help in both directions, with the parents and the children. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of children you know, need help uh, getting launched, getting their first house. You know, a lot of children are paying for their own weddings now. More and more parents can't afford it or right. chose not to do it. Or, uh, so yeah, it's a tough challenge out there, but that's the fun about uh, being a versatile advisor and focusing on the people side of it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the tools we have, the things that certified financial planners study, you know, estate planning, retirement planning, tax planning, risk management insurance and all that, that's great. There's a lot of good people out there who can help in those areas. But having someone they trust that's an advocate for them to go to and say, yeah, I have all these problems, you know, help me prioritize them, right. help me address them now or later. And uh, so it, it gets very deep and complex when uh, you know, clients invite us in to, uh, to help with family issues. Sure. And that's where it's most gratifying too. It, it turns out not to be about the money all the time. Right. I mean, the money's key and it has to be there, it has to grow well, it has to be well managed. Um, but it's secondary, in a sense, to solving some of the other issues that we work with. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, money's a means to fill a happy mm -hmm. life, right? right? And so it right. can't, can't necessarily make you happy. Right. Um, you know, you're a CPA, I'm a CPA. Um, I have this debate with my fellow CPAs, the Roth, <laughs> Roth versus non-Roth. Where do you fall out on it? Um, for, for the viewers, the Roth is you don't get a deduction for putting money in, but it, it grows tax deferred and when you take it out, it's tax free. Right. Can be pretty powerful in the right situation. Sure. So. Well, we think the IRA in general is an excellent planning tool and the Roth is a variation on that. Um, for people to pay tax and put money in a Roth, they'd have to be convinced that they'll pay less tax right. otherwise. Um, a lot of people don't like front, front loading or paying taxes sooner than they have to. So they resist the idea of taking money from an IRA, putting it into a Roth IRA and letting it compound. So we show them the numbers and that's often helpful. But where we actually use it the most is, you know, we have tax brackets that people fall between. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's now getting to be more and more steps with all these secondary yeah, level kind of taxes that are coming. <laughs> But if we have a keen sense of their income and where they are relative to the next bracket, uh, we often take a IRA rollover to a Roth that will drive their income just under the next bracket. So in a, sec in a sense, they're not wasting the benefit of that lower rate. Right. Then the Roth can grow tax free. As long as they can pay the tax out of other money, sure. this will work out. So our Roth conversions have been sort of systematic for people, yeah. where it's just small layers every year. And we find that's much more palatable to the client to just take that bite and pay that small yeah, tax. Yeah, I, I agree. And do it I mean, systematically. I'm hard pressed to sell clients, convert everything you have, and pay right. a huge tax and hope it works out. I think there's plenty of other opportunities right. to get to the Roth, like you do it. Mm -hmm. Inside 401k plans just are fund available. Fund it as you go. Yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and. What I'd like to see is clients have some Roth money when they show up at retirement because it's pretty powerful for guys like us to help with right. their taxes. Right. Tom, you have time for a question? Yes. Awesome. Janet Richards from Philadelphia asks, can I transfer funds from an investment to start a business without making a big tax problem? Talking right. about taxes. 
Okay, generally, funding a business is not a tax event, Janet. Uh, putting money in establishes your investment value. We call that in the tax world basis. It's the taking money out, which is really why you create a business where the tax challenges lie, either out as salary, benefits, or upon sale of the company or sale of part of the company. But if you have an investment that you have to sell to turn to cash to put into the company, and that may be at the root of Janet's question, that investment could have to pay a capital gain tax. Uh, there are like-kind exchange rules, but I think in the nature of her question, that Probably would not apply, apply here. Yeah. Um, so the, the taxable event is on taking money out, not putting it in. It sounds like you're going to be taxed for your business, but hopefully the business <laughs> makes enough money to make yeah. up for it. Yeah. So. Great answer. Um, if you have a question, here's how you send your question into Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Uh, welcome back. Now it's time to introduce our special guest, uh, Jerry Elman from Elman Technology Law. Um, welcome to the show, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I know you're an attorney and you specialize in technology. I guess tell us a little bit about yourself. How would you... Um, wind up specializing in technology as your law practice? Well, I started out studying chemistry and computers way years ago at Stanford University, uh, but I discovered that uh, uh, I was uh, more suited to get into uh, uh, either uh, to become a CPA like you guys or possibly <laughs> to go to law school. Uh, you made the better decision. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I was told that uh, if I became a patent attorney, I could use my background in science and technology and help uh, inventors uh, get patents for their inventions. Uh, so then I uh, went across the country, went to Columbia and uh, studied law. Now I'm here in Media, Pennsylvania with a uh, uh, tiny law firm that's called a boutique law firm, uh, uh, Elman Technology Law, and have uh, uh, a few other colleagues who uh, uh, help uh, uh, businesses and inventors get uh, patents, register their trademarks and copyrights, uh, negotiate a variety of contracts, uh, sometimes resolve disputes. Uh, uh, some of the things we might be talking about today would be that we also advise website owners and businesses how to protect themselves and their customers uh, before and after their computer systems get attacked or breached. Yeah, so I, I know <laughs> on um, websites there's a privacy policy. You know, can you explain, like, what's, what does that actually mean, the privacy policy? Sure, safeguarding personal privacy is something that's become vital to any business. Uh, uh, privacy policies and uh, websites' terms of use have to comply with quickly changing laws and regulations. Uh, and the United States and Europe have somewhat different uh, policies and principles. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, many of the uh, European jurisdictions are more stringent on privacy. Uh, in the United States, you have uh, businesses that will be collecting personal information often to show ads to you, and uh, that's a different standard than might be applied elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, uh, Restrictions might also be different depending on the uh, user of the service. Uh, for example, if you have uh, uh, children, uh, there are specific laws and regulations that apply to children accessing uh, the uh, internet and computers. So do you recommend, you know, you go on a website, you should actually look at the privacy policy and see what they're doing? Or, I mean, most people probably ignore it, right, and, and don't uh, pay much attention to it. I think the number of people who don't read those, those particular terms of use and policies is, is uh, uh, almost 100%. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's one of the problems. Except guys like you, you read them, right? <laughs> uh, well, when we're advising clients about them, we do. Uh, but one of the problems is you just don't have enough time to read everything everything that's potentially there, uh, uh, these become uh, what are sometimes called contracts of adhesion, really because they stick to you mm -hmm. like tape, mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though you haven't necessarily read them, and yet the uh, terms of use of the uh, service and the privacy policy could be important, 
uh, depending on uh, what your uh, uh, use of that particular uh, site would be. Uh, and I think that's going to be a sensitive area, and that's where uh, many businesses come to us. Some are interested in having a very uh, clearly written and customer-friendly privacy policy. Others are interested in having as much protection as they can, mm -hmm. and what we try to do is to learn as much as we can about the uh, client's uh, strategic uh, plan and then to uh, tailor the advice that we give to their interests. Right. And why is safeguarding personal privacy such a big deal for, say, business owners who might have to spend money to do so, or individuals who might have to read these things or do other things? Why does it matter so much? Uh, well, uh, I, I think you really have to look at it as uh, we as people in, in, in the new age of communication technology are living in two different realms at the same time. Uh, uh, the real world, uh, you might call it uh, real space. Uh, uh, matter of fact, that's what we do on our website. Uh, uh, I've, I've uh, uh, spoken at some uh, courses being given at Temple University Law School by my friend David Post. Uh, he likes to call it meat space. But uh, uh, in any event, that's, that's the real world where these tangible things are happening. But also, the viewers who are uh, watching this particular uh, video or podcast uh, are looking at it through what is really cyberspace, the realm of data and communications. So more and more information from the real world is getting transmitted through and warehoused in cyberspace. So we have people such as myself who are cyber lawyers, and uh, for better or worse, uh, we're also coming up with a breed of individuals who are termed cyber warriors. <laughs> uh, now, for anyone watching the news these, these days, uh, there are reports of uh, companies, uh, computer systems being hacked. Uh, Seems in, like almost every day now, yeah. right? Uh, so, it's yeah. it's uh, uh, major companies. Uh, uh, in some cases, it's uh, the personal information of credit cards. In other situations, uh, uh, as uh, recently with uh, Sony Pictures, uh, it was uh, a lot of uh, uh, information, including uh, uh, archives of emails. Yes. So these <laughs> yeah. things end up getting hacked, and there can be different kinds of detriment when they get exposed publicly. Another problem, though, is that some of the information is uh, hacked so cleverly and surreptitiously that the people who are the victims uh, don't even know they're getting hacked. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have heard the quotation last year from the uh, director of the FBI who said, well, there are two kinds of big companies. There are the companies who know they've been hacked, and there are the companies who don't yet know they've right. been hacked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if, if a viewer finds that they do business with a company that's been hacked, what, what should they go do? Is there uh, anything they should do immediately? Uh, well, uh, one desirable thing is to uh, realize that a credit card that you might have used at that particular business uh, could have been compromised and someone else might be able to steal your identity if they have enough information about you so they can impersonate you then you can have a case of identity theft. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's become such a huge problem that uh, the various state governments have required companies to notify users of, the, of their businesses when there has been that kind of a data breach and personally identifiable information has uh, uh, eked out that could be used in an identity theft situation. So uh, if you get such a notification, then uh, you probably already will have been uh, given a new credit card, if you can even identify which particular card you might have used at that uh, store or business. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, uh, uh, you should at least uh, take a look at the passwords you're using when you're logging on to various websites and uh, it's always a good idea to uh, practice, uh, well, we'll call it safe computing, an analogy to what we call safe sex. <laughs> uh, and uh, that would involve uh, both uh, uh, keeping passwords to be other than those that are easily guessed, like the word password or one, two, three, four, five, uh, make them as uh, uh, complicated as possible. 
one problem that uh, I have is remembering all the different passwords that, that, <laughs> sure. that I've been applying. Uh, I usually just write them down on different pieces of paper, but that's become a nuisance. Sure. Uh, but there are some uh, uh, pretty good and hopefully so far uh, still not yet hacked uh, password managers that are available, mm -hmm. and uh, that can be better than just uh, having a single password you use everywhere so that uh, if, if that should turn out to have been uh, compromised in one particular uh, hacking event, uh, you certainly wouldn't want to have the rest of your life also uh, uh, being uh, Now there are services that, that will allow you to sort of store your passwords with mm -hmm. them. They're internet yeah. based yeah. and I'm a little leery of it, mm -hmm. quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, or there are services, I had a credit card compromised and they very nicely offered me a subscription to a credit protection mm -hmm. and identity theft protection service, mm -hmm. which I'll name, yeah. leave nameless at this point. Um, are they worthwhile? Uh, I think so. Uh, everything is uh, potentially going to have some risk and, and mm -hmm. in this uh, realm of uh, uh, cyberspace, uh, there, there are the possibilities of a uh, dedicated uh, intruder uh, mm. getting in. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, one can avoid being the low-hanging fruit that the intruder can easily hack. Uh, and uh, uh, to the extent that you have a variety of passwords that are long and complicated enough that they, that they won't get in, or to the extent that you use other tools such as uh, three-factor authentication rather mm. than just a username and a password, but for example, uh, Google has a uh, login where in addition to a username and password, you can also uh, tie in an, an ever-changing number mm -hmm. that you can have uh, either telephone to you at particular times or actually uh, use through an app on your cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, all of these uh, uh, complicated systems become less convenient, but on the other hand, they are uh, incrementally more secure. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is going to be perfect, right. but the, the key is to make your choice, uh, just as you were saying, you don't know how long you're gonna live. <laughs> Similarly, you don't know uh, 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 how secure any particular technique is going to be, so uh, you sort well, of Unfortunately, we're breath. just about out of time, so what yeah. that, you come back, we didn't get into patents at all, so well, it's on that fine. side of the okay. But um, our next week guest is Scott Race and Stuart Race. Um, they're the owners and founders of the Philadelphia Retirement Alliance, so please join us because your money matters. Thank you.